What is a complex number? A number that has an imaginary number part. That, all right, so a number that has an imaginary part. That's about right. Let's see here. So a complex number is something like z is equal to um, x plus i y, right? And uh, let's see here. What? So we expect x and y are, are real numbers, right? And what makes this this i special? So in before 1777, when Euler invented this notation, people used square root of minus one for this, and then because basically because we have i squared is equal to minus one, right? So, all right. Well, but how how do they work? Um, so you have two of them, dw. Let's say z times w. And let's suppose z is x plus i y, and let's suppose z is a plus i b, right? How do you multiply them? Well, basically, just like normal, right? So you have x a um, plus i x um, i x b plus i y a plus i squared times y a, right? Now we can regroup this, right? We can put the so-called real and imaginary parts separately. So here's x a, and so i squared minus one. So it's x a minus y b um, plus i times what x b plus y a. But I can summarize what I'm saying really simply, which is that we multiply complex numbers just like usual, right? Usual distributivity works. The one new wrinkle is that i squared is equal to minus one, right? Now. Um, so there's kind of an obvious question to ask here is like, what on earth are you talking about? You can't take the square root of minus one, so what does this really mean, right? So there are various ways to answer that question, but let me give you three different ways you could answer that question. Different models of the complex numbers. So first of all, let me talk about C Gauss. I think this is Gauss's construction. He says, well, you can look at it as it's R2. With, I'll call it star for a second here. So basically, I take x comma y, and I multiply it with this star times a comma b. And how do you how do you this new newfangled multiplication? Um, it's going to be a complex multiplication. What's the rule? It's just x a minus y b, comma what? X b plus y a, right? You can see how Gauss came up with this, right? Well, the reason he came up with this partly is his answer to people who said, well, there's no such thing as complex numbers. You can't imagine a square root of minus one, right? Gauss said, well, I can imagine a plane, and I can define this operation on the plane. That's just the sums and differences, products, right? Nothing so esoteric about that over there. And this operation on the plane produces all of the same features as this game of symbols we were playing over here. For example, what's if you use this viewpoint, what is what is what does i look like? Well, if you, if you look at this, so here's zero. Well, first of all, what's one look like? If I look at one comma zero, star a comma b, what do I get? <coughs> see here, so x is equal to one, y is equal to zero, right? So the y terms are gone. Yeah, a b. So one zero is like one, <coughs> right? It's serving as the multiplicative identity with respect to the star operation. On the flip side, if you look at 0, 1, what happens with that? And rather than multiplying by AB, I'm going to multiply it by itself. What's that mean? Let's 
see here. So in other words, x equals to 0, and y equals to 1, a equals to 0, b equals to 1. So only the term with both y and b survives. Everything else, the other three are 0, so you just get 0, oh, minus 1, minus 1, and 0. In other words, it's, it's minus of 1, 0. So what this equation translates then into, formally speaking, so this is translated i squared equals minus 1 with the i being identified as 0, 1. So I say it's a model for C because it's, it's one thing you could use. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a set and an operation on the set which will formally reproduce all of these, these this, this multiplication and most importantly i squared equals minus 1. I mean there's more, more than just that. You're like, well, okay, then are the complex numbers R2? Well, yes, for this course, the complex numbers are going to be R2 with this, with this operation, right? You're like, well, that, that's kind of a drag. I don't, this is kind of hard. I mean, this is like awkward, right? That's right, so we don't use that notation because it's a bad notation. We use this notation because it's familiar, but you should understand that this is just a shorthand for that in this course. Now, that choice is by no means unique. There are other models you could use for the complex numbers. What are, what are the other two models I show you in the notes? Are the, um, the matrix model, and that would be something like you look at matrices of the form A, B minus B, A, <coughs> the two by two matrix. And so here, um, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, squared is equal to minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1 is equal to minus 1, 0, 0, 1. So if you use matrices, two by two real matrices of that form, just and then the, the operation would just be matrix multiplication in that context, then that num that zero one minus one zero that behaves like i. Yeah. So you're saying um, that these are models of the complex numbers in that each element of the complex numbers can be mapped to R two using that star. Well, in order to make sense of what you just said, I would first have to have a definition for complex numbers. So you pick one of these models, make it your definition, you can bijectively map onto any of the other ones and preserve the multiplication, addition, and other features of complex numbers. Can we use that as our definition? What is this? I just it's a complex it's, number? It's just symbols. I mean, I haven't. What does it mean to take a linear combination of x plus i, y? Well, I'm thinking. It's OK. I mean, the definition is going to be, I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to take as a default the Gauss definition for the complex numbers, OK? OK. But my point is that's not, we could do other things. There's other things still. You could, you could look at, um, oh, I forget what the name, I guess I called this, uh, I forget the name that came to this one. C extension, because this has to do with extension fields. So in, in math 422, you look at taking polynomials over some field and quotienting by the ideal generated by, by some polynomial. So if you take the polynomials with real coefficients and you mod by x squared plus 1, this also gives you the complex numbers. So when you work modulo um, an ideal, Essentially what that is, is it's saying the thing you're quotienting by is like zero, all right? So saying x squared plus one is like zero is essentially saying x squared is equal to minus one. So in this context, the variable x behaves like the i. But this is another way, um, is yet another way to build the complex numbers. So, we don't have to understand all possible ways to build it. We're just going to use the Gauss one in here. But I just want to make you aware that you don't have to worry about the existence of complex numbers. At least as a formal system, there are many different ways to realize it. All right, so. But some people would say, well, you can't use the formal system as a definition for it. I mean, I don't know. Now we're getting into questions of philosophy <laughs> more than math. Okay. So, 
I'm going to stop talking about the models, and I'm going to go back to this, which some of you accepted on faith at the beginning, which is, you know, fine. Just have faith. It's good. How many races? All right. So what do we, um, what would we like to do with complex numbers? Well, we'd like to talk about the real part, their imaginary part. There's something called <coughs> complex conjugation, which is so important. Um, there's something called a modulus, which is also important. Um, so let's get to those things. I have this at the end of section one, but I just, I mean, logically speaking, it kind of goes at the beginning. But I'm trying to get through it fast because I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's not good to spend too much time on it. Because some of you don't really appreciate what it is I'm saying at the moment. And that's okay, because it's, it's, it's a bit, it's a part of the um, <clears throat> So for a complex number, the z, x plus iy, uh, where x and y are real numbers, there, there are actually, um, you know, we have a definition If z is equal to x plus i y with x and y real numbers, then the real part of z is equal to x, and the imaginary part of z is equal to y. All right. So notice that the real and imaginary parts are themselves both real numbers. Okay. Now. <clears throat> Another definition. We can talk about what's called complex conjugation. Right, so if z is equal to x plus i y, then z bar is equal to x minus i y. By the way, it's going to be our custom in here that if I write z equals x plus i y, if I write, um, if any, anytime I write something like x plus i y, it's to be assumed that x and y are real variables, okay? Otherwise, I'll say x and y are real numbers about a thousand times in this course, and at some point or another, you'll get tired of it. So let it be understood that if we say z equals x plus i y, x and y are understood to be real variables, or specific real numbers. Um, all right, so that's great. And then you can play games. You can ask questions like, what are the properties of conjugation? So what do you, what do you guys? What are, what are properties of the conjugate function? How about this? Z plus W conjugate is equal to what? Z conjugate plus W. Mm -hmm. How about the minus? What about the difference of the conjugate of the difference is the difference of the conjugates as well, right? How about the conjugate of a product? Z conjugate um, times W conjugate. That would sure be nice, wouldn't it? And it's true. But it's not obvious that that's true, so let's prove it. So how do we prove it? Well, oh, check it out. So let's let z equal to x plus i y and w equal to a plus i b, right? So use the notation that I already said over there, right? That way we don't have to reinvent the wheel here in terms of the multiplication. Using our calculation from before, W conjugate is equal to what? You take the real part, you leave it alone, so that's xa minus yb, right? And you take the imaginary part, in this case xb plus ya, and you just put a minus there. So it's minus i times xb plus ya, right? You guys with me? So that, let's say that's the What's that? This, this is the, uh, in terms of what we're trying to prove, that's the, the left-hand side, right? 
Now let's focus on the right hand side. Let's see here. So we've got z bar times w bar is equal to what? Well, x minus i y, right? Times what? A minus i b, right? And then you multiply those out like normal. And by the way, you can check that the Gauss multiplication is like normal. You can check that that multiplication has the distributive property and is commutative and, uh, and the rest. Um, but we'll just assume that you can do that, which in fact you can. So it's not a bad assumption to make, right? Um, so x, a, and let's see here. What's the other? i times i is what? It's i squared minus minus is plus, so I get minus yb plus i times what? Um, oh, I guess I could factor out the minus, right? Because there's a minus. So I have minus xb uh, plus ya. So in other words, the left-hand side and the right-hand side match when we actually work them out in terms of their real and imaginary parts. Now, we have no choice but to go into this detail here right now. But as the course goes on, what do you want to do? Do you want to use a real argument or do you want to use a complex argument? I mean, you want to use a complex argument when you can. So, but at the moment, we have no choice, right, but to look at the real imaginary parts to, to, to derive this property. That's good. Are there any other properties of conjugate that might be important to think about? How about this? What's that? Like identity and reflexive. Ah, right. So the conjugate, I think this is what you're getting at. The conjugate of the conjugate is. Yeah. Yeah. So take the conjugate twice, you're back where you started. All right, now, with that said, how is the conjugate related to the real and the imaginary parts of a, of a complex number? What's the relation between these things? Oops. Yeah, I'm sorry, I spent a lot of time about the syllabus. This is way more interesting. Oh, I didn't have to talk about syllabus, did I? Of course, you guys will read it. I know your life is not complete unless you know the learning outcomes for a course you're taking. <laughs> I know I stay awake at night. What, what, what were the learning outcomes? Oh no. The learning outcomes again. Sorry, I'm fresh from faculty meetings. Or for us, my professor didn't uh, you know, read those when you are up at night. To help yourself with that. <laughs> I memorize them every year, hoping that it'll be extra credit on the test. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, so um, if we take z plus z bar, that's x plus i y plus x minus i y, what happens? Yeah, we get 2x. If we take z minus z bar, what happens? I won't write it out, but for almost the same calculation, you get 2iy. Yeah, so what this shows you is we have a little lemma, or whatever you want to call it. Call it a dragon, probably here, I don't know, whatever. Um, the real part of z is, in fact, 1 half of z plus z bar. And the imaginary part of z is equal to 1 over 2i, z minus z bar. Now, if you don't like division by i, you could also write this as follows. This is i over 2, z bar minus z. Now, what point? Wait, where, where, what? How'd that happen? Well, there's another lemma, although it's a little bit smaller, which is that i squared equals minus 1 implies that 1 over i, 
is equal to i minus i to the minus 1, right? That is something we will use many, many times, right? When you flip the imaginary unit from the numerator to the denominator, you generate a minus, which is a little bit surprising, right? But actually, it's also a little bit surprising that we square a number and get a negative number, right? So we should be expecting a few surprises here and there, right? Here's one of them. So far, so good. Um, I don't think I understood the notation. Um, you use it up there, too. What, what did you write the R or something, um, parentheses Z? Uh, right, so what is Z, Z is equal to x plus i y. So we said that the real part of Z was x. Oh, the real part. Yeah, OK. And we said that the real part of Z was uh, z. I see. OK. Yeah. So it's re and i m. I just didn't read your handwriting. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I got it I've got, all, I, I, I got a fancy uh, math fracture right. pins in the notes that I can't reproduce on the board. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what my real imaginary looks like. In OK, now that I understand that, I'm good. Good, good. Now, um, there are, of course, are some surprises about how do you actually calculate the reciprocal of a complex number, right? So if the complex number has the form x plus i y, that's called the Cartesian form, right? That's kind of our go-to standard format. Sometimes I ask you to put your answers in that format, which is kind of a drag if you have something like, say, 1 over 2 plus um, 3i, right? If I want to put that in, in its Cartesian form, what I have to do is I have to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator over the conjugate of the denominator, like so. And then what happens is you get y. You get what happens here? I get 4. And I get plus 6i. I get minus 6i. That's no accident. The whole reason to multiply by the conjugate is that it gives you a real quantity. All right? And so I actually get 4 plus 9. So there you go, that's 2 thirteenths minus 3 thirteenths i. Right, so we took this, we started with, um, this was the given thing, I'm circling in red, right? Start with that reciprocal of a complex number and we convert to this, the Cartesian form by multiplying by the conjugate over the conjugate. Now that's an example, but this is something that's generically true, right? A little proposition for you. If z is not equal to 0, oh, by the way, that's kind of an important thing to put over here. z bar equals to 0 if and only if z is equal to 0. That seems like it's worth knowing. The conjugate of a complex number is 0 only when the complex number is actually 0. So if, if, if the complex number is not 0, then 1 over z right, is equal to what? It's equal to z bar over z z bar. And it doesn't seem like I'm saying anything here, but my point is, if I take some complex number like 2 plus 3i, I can find a multiplicative inverse for it, right? There actually is a multiplicative inverse for that complex number. And the multiplicative inverse for the complex number is formed in this way. It's kind of weird that we have multiplicative inverses when you think about this from the perspective of the Gauss construction, right? I give you the vector 1, 2. What's its, what's its inverse? Right? If somebody in calculus 3 today, as I'm introducing vectors to them, asks me what's the inverse of that vector that points at 30 degrees north of east, I will tell them they're in the wrong class. <laughs> but they should come here, because here we can find multiplicative inverses of vectors, right? Because every complex number is a vector in the plane. We can look at it that way. And the multiplicative inverse you just find in this way, right? And you're like, well, how do you know it's the multiplicative inverse? Well, the proof is in the pudding, I suppose. So if it's right, then we should be able to say z times 1 over z is equal to what? It better be equal to 1. So what is this? This gives us z times what? My claim is that this is the multiplicative inverse, right? So I just put z bar divided by z z bar. What do you get? You get z bar z 
over to the CUC bar. <laughs> oh, I think that maybe is another important property. But actually, that's more a property of complex numbers that they're, they're commutative, right? So z bar z and zz bar are the same. Anyway, so they're both non-zero, so we can cancel and get one. So this is the, uh, the proof. If I was asked this question on a test, I would try to ask it in a way which made it seem like less of an exercise and, and nothingness. The way I would do that would be to change the notation so you could see that there was actually a question being asked. Some of you think, well, you wrote one over it, so that's the multiplicative inverse, right? That's because you've been taught that one over things are multiplicative inverses. The idea that you have to ask the question, is there a multiplicative inverse is probably new to your experience. Right? Is there a multiplicative inverse to three? Yes, it's one over three. Mm -hmm. right? But what does one over three mean? That's a deeper question, right? What is one over three? What's a real number? We never really told you that either. But you're used to think of real numbers as lines, right? So you don't maybe you don't think about it as much as you should. Well anyway. <clears throat> we have now encountered the next big player in the game here, which is the modulus. What is the modulus? So the modulus of z, we use this. Sometimes people will call this absolute value. I don't call it absolute value. This is the modulus. It's also called the norm. Um, it's the length of z as a vector. So it's, the, it's it would be like the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? But that's not the best formula for it. Another way to look at that is that's the square root of zz bar. Because if you calculate zz bar, what do you get? Check it out, z times z bar is equal to x squared plus y squared. Of course, we discovered that down here, right? This 2 plus 3i, if you look at it as a vector in the complex plane, so here's the real part, here's the real direction, here's the imaginary direction. 2 plus 3i is something like what? Like this. The length of that, if you go 2 over and 3 up, the length of that squared is 13. Right there, right? Four squared plus three, four plus nine. So. so this is the modulus, this is the length of the complex number. So in other words, the length of a complex number is related to the product of the complex number times its conjugate. There's this wonderful relation between the algebra of complex numbers and the geometry of complex numbers. And that's one of the things that makes this so different than other things you might study. All right. But anyway, I'm sadly out of time for today. So next time we will start with the modulus. I will show you all of its wonderful properties, and we'll get back to track. I'm already behind, of course. Thanks, guys. Oh, and so who wants to take next class? Oh, let me turn it off, and then we'll follow that. Do I have a volunteer?